guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest, I hate saying the name. I can't say the name of the team, but his name, he was a great <laughs> offensive line. He blocked a lot of people, three-time Super Bowl champion, and the co-host of Let Me Tell You Something, Mr. Nate Newton. Yes. Nate, how are you today, sir? <laughs> yes, sir. Good to see you, Kevin, man. It's easy for me to, to talk about the Rangers. It ain't hard for me to mention the Rangers. You know what I'm saying? So, but it's good. It's cool. It's cool, man. You're looking good. Uh, I saw a beautiful young lady that was on earlier. You know, we was trying to get this thing rocking and rolling because Spencer Bass had us messed up. Yeah, I got to call you out. I, I, don't, I don't let nothing ride, uh, Kevin. I don't let nothing ride. So whoever the beautiful young lady was, tell her I say hello and, and <laughs> good to see you, She didn't want to leave until Kevin. Spencer acknowledged her, so they've been going back and forth this morning. <laughs> so, but no, nah, yes. man, I appreciate Nate jumping on. Um, I know this, well, coming up, the NFL draft, big day, big day coming yes. up. So yes. from your perspective, Nate, coming out of college – the draft, it's a different feel for baseball than it is, I think, for the NFL because we mm -hmm. had, I think when I was drafted, we had yes. 50 rounds and I, they've cut it down. Yeah. Woo. So, right. and you guys have what, seven? Is that what it is, Matt? We had seven and, and, and it used to be 16 when I first started watching the draft. And then I think they cut it down to 11 or 12 by the time I got to the draft. And you know what's so, so, so disheartening, Kev? Is I couldn't even get it drafted when it was 12 <laughs> rounds. <laughs> I wasn't even good enough to be drafted when it was 12. When were you drafted when you came up for the fourth Rangers round, and all those guys? Fourth round. So it. Lord, geez, how many now rounds do you have? I think there's only th uh, 35, maybe. 35 when, I was, when, you, when, I was when playing, you was I think balling? 50 something, maybe? Yeah. Woo. I think At least you. And if that. That means you are a good yeah. player, bro. Oh, yeah. And that means I wasn't a good player. I, 12 rounds and I couldn't get drafted. <laughs> that, that's the, thing. That's the wow. thing you've got. And plus, that's not even on top of the guys that were undrafted that get signed, kind of like with you guys. So I'm thinking about yes. the amount of players that go through that, the amount of money. And it's, you know, it's changed uh, exponentially now that they have loopholes. And NFL had it as right. well, where what Bradford yes, got $70 million yes, or something out of the dress. Something ridiculous, right? Sam Bradford got. Woo. And, Yes, I mean when they used to play play you for pay you for potential only and not for production. And, wow, and they're mm. making more money now than ever, and yet all that stuff completely changed. So, so going into it, what you know, yes. I'm sure you hear the hype, right? Your your school, hey, agents and guys coming to you, hey Nate, you're gonna go, you're gonna get drafted, this and that. So, what what were you hearing as a as a high, as a college junior, college senior? Was your junior senior get drafted? Uh. I, for me, it was is a, a back then. It was you okay. had to be a senior, you had to have played four years of college ball, or equivalent to that, you know. And so, uh, nobody, you know, the, the few agents that came at me at Florida and them, uh, they 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 didn't they didn't preach that. It was like you know, you you you'll be a free agent. Uh, uh, if you do get drafted, it'll be in the 12th round, later in the 12th round. And so I wasn't even thinking that. So, But I was still excited as a young man watching the draft. I watched the draft. I, I hung around the house. I think the Pittsburgh Steelers called me at around about the ninth or 10th round and said, man, a scout called me. I'm trying to fight for you. I'm trying to get you drafted. 
But if we don't, can we possibly get you as a – and that, you know that was a yep. setup. You know, you calling me to fill me out to see if I'm ready to sign with y'all as a free agent. I said, well, sir, y'all y'all do what you have to do. This is the uh, number to my agent, which is a gym leader, a baseball guy. You know, he was a baseball <laughs> guy, uh, into you know, because he had strawberry. He had, uh, uh, I think he, I can't think of Dwight Good, and he had guys like that who was his guys. And so I was just, uh, he was trying to break into football. And uh, at that time, we had the USFL too, you know, the original USFL. So he was a straight up guy, Christian guy, just straight up, man. Jim Nieder, and he was like, man, I don't I don't see you getting drafted, but here's my number. Uh, he had like five or six guys off of the one Florida a and team that, you know, he figured had a shot at least getting a, a free agent contract. So uh, several teams called me, but I, I, I knew uh, that was that was the uh, Dan Marino era. I came in with Dan Marino and all of those guys, and uh, so we had some great. It was a quarterback uh, gifted draft, and a lot of great players came out of that draft. So it, uh, it didn't bother me about not getting drafted. Uh, but when I got into camp and saw the competition I was going against with the Washington uh, Commanders that they are now. Back then it was the Redskins. Uh, that's who I signed with as a free agent. And uh, I was just excited, man. I wasn't looking to make nobody team. And it di really didn't even act like I should have been there, even though I had guys in my corner. And it's a head coach that really loved me, Coach Gibbs. And he was he just couldn't believe that here's this guy with his talent, just having fun and jacking around. You know, that's what I, you know, that's how I got released, just jacking around, <laughs> having fun. Yeah. So <laughs> that's different, ain't it? Man? I know that's different than what you used to normally hearing, you know. But that, that was the life of yeah, a young man. I mean, so, it, I mean, so you're not really. It, it's approached by teams that are coming and just saying, "This is what we're looking for." But they bring in. I mean, guys come in, right? Even undrafted guys, they bring you in for a workout, is, is all yeah. it is, and then it's just, it's you got to fight for it, right? B back in my day, Kev. Let me explain to you. Back in my day, uh, once you were eligible for the draft. It was they didn't bring you in. Uh, scouts came to your home, like they much like they do like now after the after the combine. Guys work out, have personal workouts. Where if a team wanted you, teams were so secretive back then, and so just shut and closed mouth. I went to the Bledsoe Scouting Combine. It was only about seven teams: Detroit, Dallas, and a few other teams that got together. And we was at the Pontiac Silverdome, and we worked out maybe 100, 200 guys and that they selected and thought that could be drafted. And, you know, I felt just honored to go and work out with all of these, you know, Power Five guys. So, but what guys would do, they were so secretive back then that they would come. They're like, hey, man, I'm going to fly in on this day. Be ready. I'm going to work you out. I had Tampa Bay come to Orlando and work out. I, I've worked out for the Washington Commanders, and I think I worked out for one other team. And they just flew in, and they flew out, you know. Uh, I thought that if anybody would sign me, it would be the Pittsburgh Steelers because when I was at the Bledsoe Scouting Combine, they paid the most attention to me. Uh, now, we had our workout where Florida State was the major school up on the north end of Tallahassee, they were that 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 you know they that power five school. So what they would do is in the week that they would have those workouts for the for Florida State, they would call our coach and say, "Hey, on Thursday, Friday, this time, guys that are you know that want to work out or guys that are eligible to work out, this is the workout times." And so we had to be there, to loosen up. So when this scout came to us, we had to be ready because. Uh, for lack of a better term, we were second class citizens compared to the Florida yeah. State guys. And uh and we worked out and that's what we did. And uh and maybe because I didn't think that these guys was taking us serious, I didn't take them serious. And it was my career I was playing with and wasn't mature enough to know it. So, you know, I know you're like, well, well I, I was you know, I tell, like I tell people, other guys, now that this thing is taking a turn uh, and it's a lot more serious, it's a lot more computerized, up to date, everybody knows everybody's business. Uh, maybe I would take it different to, in today's world, but back then I, I really didn't think 
that I would be I would be on anybody. Did they roster. do the interviews with you, the the personal stuff where they just sit down with you like this and 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 have these conversations, or is it just basically word of mouth through a scout? Uh, yeah, a scout. Yeah, the scout did it all, and uh, I think it was better football then. What? I think it was better. Why football do you say that? Because because coaches can pick players, but I, I'm telling you, Kevin. If I was a scout, and let's say I was looking at you as a as a, any any sport, it don't matter what sport. Well, first of all, you're not gonna know I'm looking at you for a couple of months because you may hear like, "Hey, this scout for the Cowboys came around, and uh, who did? Well, what did he want? Well, he talked to the trainer. He talked to the uh, to the equipment man, and he just went up on campus to talk to some of the people that. You know, just hey, how is Kevin? Because first of all, they wanted to know what were your character mm-hmm. was like. You know, who what what who were you really? Were you a selfish person? Were you a team type person? And then I would contact the coach and ask for film. And once I watched film on you and made a decision from what I've talked from the outside world and saw your football habits and what you did on the field, then I would talk to your head coach. And then I would talk to your position coach because I don't want to know. I don't want to have an already preconceived notion like a lot of coaches, like a lot of scouts did. You know, a lot of guys got drafted lower because they didn't do their homework on the back end. So when they talk to the head coach first or the position coach that may not like you or may not care for you, you you got a you you got a misconception on this kid. Now you missed out on a great kid. So that's how I would have done it. Yeah. And so and a lot of scouts did it that way. They wanted to know about you. Like Gil Brandt was one of the best scouts ever. But until Gil trusted a, a head coach, a trusted uh, the the people on the front end, he always talked to the to the trainer, to other players. To, to equipment men, stuff like that, trying to find out who this yeah. guy is, what he's about. And so uh, that's, just how, that's just how it went. And they did the interviews, the scouts. The scouts, they all met. You know, they had their different regions. And, you know, and I've learned this over the years that this is how they did it, especially back in the old school days where they did all the footwork. And they came to the coach after they found out what, what they like in a player. The scouts are already had what they thought a player should be. And the coaches had the thoughts of actually putting the players on the field and coaching them what they think a should, player should be. So the scouts would do all the footwork, all the layer work, and they would bring it back and hand it to the head coach uh, and the position coaches and say, hey, this is what we accumulated. What do you like? Now, that's when the coaches step in. Now, the owner and coaches have always been big on the first round. But in the NFL, the scouts from maybe the third round on does most of the drafting. The good teams, uh, and I I say the good teams like the Steelers and the ugly green team in the (laughs) East, they have great scouting combines. Uh, and they have great – because they e- they can easily rebuild because they know their blueprint. The Cowboys have had problems because they don't really have a blueprint. You know, uh, we have never uh, been able to say, besides offensive linemen, been able to draft a position, maybe offensive line and wide receiver, draft, a, to draft and know what you're looking for. Like the Steelers, three, four linebackers, they're the master. Yeah. They are the master. Defensive linemen, Philadelphia will go get you one all day, every day. It's just certain teams you can lock up and say, they know what this look like. The Bears, I don't know now, but the Bear linebacker, they can pick them in their sleep. They used to pick them in their sleep. And so – when you're dealing with scouts that are doing most of the footwork and the GM is doing most of the footwork, I'm talking about a, a true GM. Mr. Jones, he knows I love him, but he's not a true GM. Uh, 
uh, his son is his son is more of that GM now, but you have to go out and live this this world. And uh it's only a few teams I think that 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 does that, still does that. The Cowboys used to be number one at it. Them, the Steelers, the Giants. Uh, when I was coming up, these were the teams that you could not t- mess around with. The 49ers, they knew what their system required, and they could go out and get those yeah, players. You're right, though. They, you, you see that now more and more position guys throughout the NFL with um, – with with that, I mean, you're right. The amount of homework that they do because the amount of money that's invested, so they are going, yes. like you said, from yeah. like, down to the nitty gritties of cutting through and getting all that done. And it's amazing, especially like you said, the amount of money that they're putting in. That's an investment, and I think that's why with with what seven rounds in the NFL, of why. So yeah, it, yes, we really have to do our extra homework because of there's only a few that that really fit into this what this mold of what we need. So. Right, they're going to do their their leg work, mm. but it, you know, like you said, it was a little bit different when you were playing. There were more rounds, so it, right. it wasn't as compact. Right. They didn't have the numbers like they do now, the analytics and the video. So, but you know, baseball, I don't remember any of them doing that stuff. It was just somebody's there. They talk to you. You talk to agents. You know, to start calling and say, "Hey, you know, there's a chance you could get drafted." This and that. And then they talk. But other than that, we didn't really have any kind of formal interviews other than maybe a like a color chart where you can see, you know, zero to 10 pick colors. And that's where I finally realized <laughs> I was colorblind. I couldn't get past number four. So it was one of those I looked and right. luckily I only had hit the white wow. ball, but th- that was really all the interaction we really had. And then phone call and draft draft day. And you figure out now, I think it's spread over a couple days of doing it. You know, the first round's always, everything's aired right now, all the drafts, all sports, right? everything's aired. But other than that, it was just a phone call. You know, hey, you got drafted. Okay. The thing, the thing about it, though, I understood baseball a little bit better because y'all had so many leagues. Even, even, even when y'all were kids, it was y'all had the A team, B team. I know they had different mm-hmm. names. I'm just being simple. Y'all had A, B, and C players, and it never stopped. Even in college, y'all had A, B, and C players, and these scouts. I always was watching from afar. Whereas I I in, the NF, in the NFL, yeah. they never stopped. They never started looking at us until we got in yeah. college. Some of you guys were good enough that y'all were looked at in yeah. high school. So people knew that my, I had uncles, un, un, uncles that played uh, baseball for different teams and different, um, even back, and this is 30 yeah. years ago. So baseball has always had some type of system in place. Whereas football, like I say, when you get into 12th grade and you get into college, it wasn't a such thing as a super freshman because you were going to get red shirted and you weren't going to play a lot. So the scouts didn't really get to see you until your sophomore year. If you were an impact player, because you had to sit on that pine. And then when you became a junior, now Unless you were elite, in which that was far and few between when I was coming through, you you they they didn't see you. So when they got a chance to get with you and see you, they had to put their homework. They had to start doing yeah. their homework. And the smart teams, which the Cowboys and the Steelers were way ahead of the game back then, they was they was dispatching guys. You got the southeast region. You lap over into this region, going up up north. You know you got the north and. And they would lap over you. You and they would double check each other's work. Yeah, you know. And where the players were at that time was in the south, and in the northeast. That's where the players were presumed to be. Now we know players are, come from everywhere, but back in the day, in the south and in the, in the north, in, the, in you know, in the northeast, that's where they presume most of the players was. So you know, and that's yeah. how it went. And so. The smarter teams like the Cowboys, they had five and six and seven and eight scouts, while other teams would maybe have two or three scouts scanning yeah. the country. And they knew, and it's and you're right, and some of those would overlap. But and, and you talk about how, f- you know right. how you know like you said social media and film and everything. Now they can find guys all over the place. You know, you, now you're finding guys yes. in Australia playing in Australia. You know, rug, you know Australian yeah. rules football. You got guys from all over the place, and it's amazing how global this has become on, on all sports, really. But especially, I mean, football. 
Because you always think yeah. football is an American sport, but I mean it's it's gone global. I know they've talked about wanting to move team, which is a whole another you know talk, but move the teams to Europe <laughs> and everything else. But I mean it's and it's it's tough because of right. You know when we were playing high school, you said eighteen you could get drafted or twenty one in college yeah. or your junior year, whatever came first. So, but as a football player, you just you still had to go for another three four years. You could at eighteen. You know, yes. you couldn't be ready. You know, oh, going to the NFL, you're never going to see that. So, and it's it's a hard. So that mentality right. of, right? Maybe that weeded out a lot more guys that were playing football. Eighteen. Gosh, I don't know if I could do this for another four years and wait. Right? I'm sure you played with guys that were that way, <laughs> right. as opposed to right. right. So now you can be a junior and get drafted. Uh, it's all about maturity. And 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 I wasn't mature, man. I, it, it's amazing. I, I I went all the way into my uh, senior year, and uh, the end of my junior year, uh, yeah, the beginning of my senior year, that's when the USFL popped up, and uh, they were drafting guys, and they had guys that fell up under their, you know, if you fell into a certain area, this team had like Tampa Bay had most of Florida. You know, the Birmingham staff, you had all of Alabama and a little bit of uh, Georgia. So uh, just depending on, you know, that and you were the automatic pick for them. They didn't have to pick you. You fell up under their uh, their area. So you you were their guy. And that's how I went to wound up at the Tampa Bay. I went to Washington first, got released, made it to their last cut, and then I went, went back to uh, – to uh, the Tampa Bay Bandits, and uh, I met Marty. I can't think of Coach Marty's. Uh, I don't know if that's first name or last name, but I can't, you know. But anyway, he was the first guy uh, that just talked to me hard. I mean, it's like you know, I'm I'm in practice having fun, jacking around, and he just pulled me to the side. He said, "Man, you know, I call the people at Washington." And he said, do you, do you really want to make my team the Tampa Bay Bandits? I said, yeah, Coach, I'll let you know me. Ah, okay, yeah, cool. All right. I'll, you know, he said, quit, quit, you know, messing around, man. He said, you didn't, you didn't get released because you wasn't good enough. You got released because you jacked around. They trying to win Super Bowls, which they had just – they won a Super Bowl that following year after I got released. You could have been on a Super Bowl winning team and you jacking around, playing around. Is you going to ever take anything serious? Uh, and it kind of shook me, you know, because nobody never came yeah. at me from that point of view, you know. And, uh, and it changed who I was and kind of changed a lot of the things I did when it came to – I was good when I was competing. You know, if I went against a guy, I, I was down for but get myself ready mentally and from all that different uh, – yeah. I wasn't mature. I was young. I was, I was 20. 19, 20, 21, but I wasn't mature more. You probably was way more mature at that age when it came to your sport than I was. And uh, so, but guys now, they take this thing so serious. You know, you, you know, a kid can be 17 and have a mindset that, hey, you know, he, yeah. he's ready, you know, and he's doing everything possible for that. Now, you still going to have a guy that, you know, be a little bit out of shape or, have a little bump and grind right here, but I, man, I was yeah. off the chain. Hey, you're right. I think some of that is, like you said, there's, it, a lot of us are immature at that age. We don't know anything, especially even back then. Yes. Um, yes. But but you're right. The way things are now, everything's so laser focused at such a young age. These guys are, they're basically machines bred to to do that. But I'm sure there are a lot of guys that just <laughs> yeah. fade because yeah. of the burnout that they're that they're forced into. I mean, heck, look where we live. Football is is king here. That's all it is. Everywhere you go. Yes. So, I mean, it's, you know, watching that and seeing that, I'm sure there are some great athletes that we'll never hear of because of that mentality, right? There, It's almost like there was – you were talking about you yeah. were so far on one side, and now these guys are so far on the other. Maybe there's somewhere in the middle where they can figure it out. But, you know, only time will tell. Where they can be a kid. Yeah. My kid went to the University of Texas. Uh, he stopped because they had one too many concussions. And uh, but he had, he would have had a shot at being a pro running back, and uh, I think he had the right mentality. You know, he was he was a good kid, uh, got his degree in uh, business communication, uh, was always a level headed kid, loved football, but he also knew how to have fun, 
you know, not 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 like his pop, not over overboard, you know. Got to have the extra yeah. beer, you know. Got to, you know, run the girls. Yeah. Got to, you know, uh, jump in the wrong car. Yeah, you know, he was that guy that you know gonna have one girlfriend. Uh, wasn't gonna drink, you know, just just the yeah. right kid for the job. But like I say, he, he was that physical thing of the, you know. And so I tell people like this here, man, when it comes to the NFL, especially when you're talking about being a top two pick, a first or second rounder, the money, yeah, they spend. Uh, you and I'll use this kid from Georgia. Uh, uh, Jalen Carter. Yeah. Carter. This kid, you know how what this kid has been in was horrific. You know, a couple of deaths, racing a car, a uh, couple of people got, you know, you know, not no longer yeah. with us. This kid is still ranked in some of the rankings, ESPN, ranked number five. Maybe he's a top 10 pick. Do you know how good he has yes. to be to have went through what he's went through and still possibly be a top 10 pick? How good yeah. he is. But the immaturity he's shown, he could have been the first player picked easily or the second player picked, even with these quarterbacks that everybody like. So uh, the money they spend – the, the guys who they're trying to put as the face of their franchise, uh, I, I can't imagine it, man. Even now that I know this, even now that I see this, and talking to you and the other guys, that the Dub Network, all of us are, were great athletes, great performers, you know. And, 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 and I still say that some of these cats that are coming out, how ultra-talented they are. And the money that the NFL is spending to investigate, especially for the, your first and second round pick players, the money that they're putting in, the time that they're putting in, man, it still may not hit right. But I'm just giving you a guy who's could have been a top pick, but just through his in, immaturity, he didn't fall far. You know, I know it's the difference between first round, first player pick, then maybe tenth, eleventh player pick, but you're still a yep. first round pick. You know, so it, it's it's money being spent, it's time being invested. Uh, it's just it's just what team that's willing to get on the table for you. What guy? I had guys believed in me, even when I got to the Cowboys. I had a couple of coaches, you know, because I went to a team, the Cowboys, that did not like fat guys. Fat guys were off the table. They was like red listed. You know, when you get the red mm -hmm. by your name, that means do not touch. So when you got over 280 pounds, the Cowboys started putting little warning signs up there. So can you imagine a guy 340 pounds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the red sign oh, they yeah. had on me. And they took a chance. Yeah, they took a yeah. chance. And that's, and that's good. Like you said, just that's the opportunity you were given. And, you know, you're able to talk about it and see. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see where these guys, where this, this thing plays out. Um, you know, it just it gets cut down to the nitty-gritty, like you said, the amount of money. And you have all the projections and everything else. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to what, what they need and what's, what's best available. So, you know, this, these next weeks and a few weeks, even the, the undrafted guys, and it'd be interesting to see where, where this all plays out. So, um but you know, what are you? What are you? What? Uh, and let's get a little more specific, man. The Cowboys, in my opinion, need need offensive linemen. And uh, and the guys that are in the first round, they're not going to be there. The, the the elite guys, the guys that you can depend on to walk in there and start, are not going to be there. Uh, for us, so we're looking at a tight. So tight end would be our sec second option. And I like this Darnell Washington kid out of Georgia yeah. uh, as our second option, uh, as a first-round pick. But they got him projected in the second round, high in the second round. And then the, the running back, I, I, the kid, B. John Robinson, that's not my guy. Uh, you know, I, I like the kid at Bama, uh, Gibbs. Uh, I, I like him a lot. He's a playmaker. He's very explosive. He's kind of around the uh, the uh, Tony Pollard uh, Ilk, but I think he's faster yeah. than Tony. 
Uh, Tony will have the um, advantage for his experience, but th those are the guys that I like. And then uh, it's one other tackle. Let me look him up here. Uh, that uh, some guys inside told me about. Uh, he's a kid from. Uh, mm, where where are you? I can't find him. But his uh, he's a kid from uh, South Dakota State somewhere. Uh, he ain't got no teeth in Hockey front. Player. I know, I wish. Uh, hockey player. <laughs> hey, yeah. I don't know what he is, bro. But uh, Cody, he, how you pronounce this? M A U C H. Mouch. Mouch. Sounds like Mouch or Mouch. Yeah, Cody Mouch, <laughs> North Dakota State. He's an offensive tackle. He's six five, three zero two. North Dakota State. I wish I could show you a picture of this kid. I may have a picture of him because guys yeah. that I like, it seems like the Cowboys never uh, get these guys. They never want these guys, but they always yeah. turn out to be uh, hell of a players down the road. I mean, what y'all know what y'all need? Do you know what the Eagles need, or do you have a wish list for the Eagles? Or? I don't know. Huh? What? What? Come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come I on, you think y'all got it going on that good? really what, what they need. I've been dealing with so much stuff else going on. It's, they talk about Bijan and uh, uh, either the either Jalen Carter. What y'all need Bijan for? Y'all got running back. That's just what, I don't know, or they trade out. I don't know. That's why I'd be interested just to see what happens in the net this this week with the draft. Hey, I'm going oh, to yeah, show you this, I saw this that guy, guy yeah, man. I saw I'm going to try yeah. to show you Cody. I did see that guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Cody, baby. That's Cody. We can get him in the second round, baby. We can get him and say, hey, you know what? Because I, I Kevin, listen to me. The difference between the Cowboys, the Philadelphia Eagles, the, the 49ers, is we don't have a big game hunter. Y'all have several big game hunters, guys that can go out and make plays at the right moments or galvanize their teams at the right moment. We don't have that guy. And our guys, enough of them. Uh, and until the Cowboys learn that maybe we can get a tight end, and this Washington kid that's big and physical, uh, he's 6'7", 280, 270, runs about a 4'6", but he's physical, he's mean. Uh, this, 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 this kid, uh, Cody, he's physical, he's mean. You started with Ashley with Tyler Smith. We need guys that when the crunch time come, we can get physical. We can get mean. And if our quarterback, we don't – our quarterback is much like y'all quarterback, but y'all quarterback, Jalen, has learned the value of the ball. The bigger the game, the more value of the ball. He doesn't turn that ball over. And even when he was running down there and hit it on his leg, that was, that, that was the most freakiest thing I ever saw because that was the difference yeah. in that game against, against those guys. And so – as much as I love Dak and want him to prosper, if he don't learn the value of the, of the, of the ball, especially in the bigger games, you, you're spinning your wheels. Because he who has the ball the most lasts the longest and plays the next day. And, that, and that's just the bottom yeah. line. Yeah. And it'll be interesting wow. to see what happens here with hmm. trades and everything else. Um I'm sure you and Zay will be talking about it for sure. See. Yeah, definitely, man. My 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 thing is, my brother, is I, I love talking to you, man, and I love just conversing with other guys from other sports, man. And I know I probably didn't get to answer the questions you wanted to answer. That I hope nah, I got you're close. Good. But, uh, man, it's always an honor Absolutely. talking to you, Like man. I said, we'll, we'll definitely follow this up again and, and just see. But, like I said, I, we always like the perspective yeah. of it and everything else. And people get a chance to listen to you and Zay on Let Me Tell You Something on, on the Dub Network. And yeah. Like I said, we'll revisit it and we'll see right. what happens after this draft. And uh, After the draft. I mean, like uh, two or three days after the draft, yeah, absolutely. we'll hook up. 
and we'll just do do hey we'll do your show and my our show as one perfect and make it happen perfect well i appreciate you jumping on nate and talking about this and we'll uh like i said it'll be fun to see what happens here because it gets down to crunch time and everything so but right. i appreciate it, nate yes sir thanks brother man we'll be in touch yes thank sir thank you man right, i man. appreciate it see all you right. all right